Welcome to Wayne's Old Time Radio Page channel. I'm Wayne, your host. These programs are brought to you by support of our listeners. You can give your support at Patreon or PayPal, either one. There's clickable links in the description below. Thanks for your support. And enjoy the shows. If you'd like for me to get you a shout out, there's a link to PayPal in the description below. Leave us a donation. We'll get it up here for you. Just tell us who you want it to. You, a friend, a girlfriend, a wife, spouse, whatever. And we'll get it up here. Hello, Yukon 38309. Yes, this is Candy Madsen. Yes, yes, this is Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson, I've been trying to get in touch with you the past two days. Well, I've been out of town. Just who is this speaking? Mrs. Allison Gray. You may have heard of my husband. The famous industrialist? Who hasn't heard of him? You've got to help me, Miss Matson. I'm, I'm desperate. Well, you sound it. What seems to be wrong, Mrs. Gray? I understand you do work of a confidential nature. You understand correctly. Can you drop out to see me, Miss Matson? Right away. Well, you'll have to give me some idea of what it's all about, Mrs. Gray. There are certain types of cases I refuse to accept. Do, do I have to tell you on the phone? If we're going to do business, yes. Well, it's my husband. For the past month, I've felt that he's been gradually losing his mind. What? It's horrible. But yesterday, he disappeared completely. You don't have to say another word, Mrs. Gray. I'll be right out. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Madsen, Yukon 38309. That's the way it usually goes. I live in a penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Inside, there's a phone. It's listed and it rings. Sometimes I wish it wasn't and didn't. But the phone is listed thusly, Candy Madsen, private investigator. And that's how I make my living. Do you remember that old gag about what's black and white and red all over? Yeah, a newspaper. Well, because of that telephone call from Mrs. Allison Gray, I had a switch. I had my palm red and got black and blue all over. And for good measure, I uncovered two very dead corpses along the way. I got the address of the Allison Grays out on Broadway in the Valley of Wealth, and that's where I went. As I pulled up at the front door, I looked for the bell, but there was none. Nothing but a huge knocker looking like it weighed about ten tons. I whacked it a couple of times and thought the house would fall off its foundations. Uh, oui, mademoiselle? Oh, uh, oui. Je suis ici pour un rendezvous avec Madame Gray. Oh, parlez-vous français, mademoiselle? Uh, oui. Lowell High School style. Entrez, s'il vous plaît, mademoiselle. Uh, oui. C'est un bonjour, n'est-ce pas? Oh, oui. Uh, <laughs> I'll bet you run out before I do. You can say that again. Oh, you speak English? Yeah, San Francisco style. <laughs> uh, you Miss Matson? Uh, that's right. Miss Gray's expecting you. You'll uh, find her in the <clears throat> library. Don't overdo it, Clyde. Uh, say, what kind of a place is this anyway? You'll find out. Uh, right on in, please. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, Miss Matson? Uh, yes, Mrs. Gray. Oh, do come in. My, how attractive you are. I expected a, a severe type of woman. Sit down, won't you, please? Well, thank you. You've got to help me, Miss Matson. My whole life has been turned into a phantasmagoria. Mm, that's a good word. Uh, tell me more about the phantasmagoria. Well, my husband and I have been married 30 years. All that time he's been kind, considerate, generous. And with money yet. That makes him quite a man. But in business, he's just the opposite. He's ruthless. And I'm afraid he's made a good many enemies. Well, I guess you have to be like that in business if you want to be successful, Mrs. Gray. I know of at least a half dozen men who have been led into financial ruin because of my husband's operations. And this all leads to... Just this. I believe that his business tactics finally began to prey on his mind. For the past month, he's looked as though he were suffering from shock or concussion. Well, maybe that's it. Uh, no, Miss Madsen. I, I was a nurse before I married Mr. Gray. I know the symptoms. My husband, I'm sure, is on the edge of a complete mental collapse. 
if it hasn't happened already. Well, and just how do I fit into the picture? Find him, please. Then perhaps we can get to the root of all the trouble. I'd, I'd die if anything happened to well, him. You should know his habits. Can't you find him, Mrs. Gray? Can an amateur pianist do the work of a Rubenstein? No, Miss Matson. You're a professional sleuth. That's why I called you. Okay. You've got yourself a girl. As of now, I'm on the payroll. What is your fee, Miss Matson? Two hundred in advance, fifty dollars a day in expenses. That's reasonable. I'll make out a check for you right away. Fine. Oh, hello, Auntie. I just... Oh. Excuse me. Didn't know you had company. Perfectly all right, Robert. May I present my nephew, Robert Warnicky? This is Miss Candy Matson. How do you do? It's loud as now, you. Matson, eh? That name is familiar. Yes, yes, you're a lady reporter or something of the sort, aren't you? <laughs> no, no. No, I'm afraid not, Mr. Warnicky. Let the girl alone, Robert. She's here on business. Here you are, Miss Matson. Thank you, Mrs. Gray. Well, I'd better be getting along. You'll hear from me soon. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Warnicky. I'll be seeing you. Yes. Yes, I have a hunch you most certainly will. I left the house, got in my car, and as I drove along, I did some thinking. It was a strange thing. Here was a, a family with all the loot in the world, but unhappy didn't make sense. Suddenly I realized I wasn't far from the studios of an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson, a darn good photographer, now that he's given up the grape, the kind that comes in bottles. As luck would have it, he was in and gave me a greeting worthy of the prodigal son. Candy, you minx. Where on earth have you been, Dove? Minx and Dove? You make me feel as if I should be molting. What do you mean, where have I been? Just what the question implies, dear. Where have you been? Up in Eureka on a case. Oh, and how did you find Eureka? With radar. You've never seen such fog. Oh. Well, why this deep concern about me whereabouts? I've been trying to get in touch with you. Uh, I've some business for you, dear. No, thanks, Rembrandt. I already have some. Oh, she's an old customer of mine. I've photographed her so often, I know every little wrinkle. <laughs> I've even given them names. No, I told you, Ducky, I couldn't possibly... Her neck has more lines than a California road map. Uh, Rembrandt, for the last time... Her I name is Gray. What? what did you say her name was? Gray, sweet little old fluff, lives out on Broadway. Mrs. Allison Gray? Yes, that's the one. Well, Rembrandt, I just now left her house not more than ten minutes ago. Oh, splendid. She got in touch with you. She dropped in my studio several days ago, and I recommended you. Get yourself a fine fat fee, Dove. She can afford it. Well, do you know anything about the deal? Only that she's worried about her husband. That's nothing. I'm worried about mine. Oh, girl, you're not married. That's why I'm worried. You mean you still can't get Lieutenant Mallard to see the light? Right. Every time we even get near the subject of matrimony, Mallard ducks. Mallard ducks. Okay, I'll leave. I would if I were you. Mallard ducks. <laughs> really? Well, did you accept the case? I'm afraid I did, Rembrandt. Then you might be interested in this. <laughs> Here. What's this? A card. You can read. Yeah. Madame Natasha, palmistry, telepathy, sittings by appointment only. W what's this all about? May not have any connection in the least, but it fell out of Mrs. Gray's purse as she left the other afternoon. Palmistry yet? This gal goes in for wrinkles all over. Rembrandt may sound as though he has bird gravel for brains, but he's been around me long enough to know a lead when he sees one. So I took the card and left. I cut over to Union and down to Kearney Street and then to the Hall of Justice on the corner of Washington. That's where my boy Mallard hangs his hat. Lieutenant Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A wonderful guy if he'd only swap stars. The one pinned on the inside of his coat for the ones up in the sky. Well, bust my rank and call me patrolman if it isn't candy. Hi, you beautiful thing, you. Well, what have you been doing? Sniffing too much sulfur and molasses? Oh, well, merely stating the truth. Gee, you look swell, candy. Oh, well, in that case, no comment. <laughs> I'd better quit while I'm ahead. Well, Foot Flat, what's new? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm liable to lose my job. In the last 24 hours, there's been only one crime reported. Some kid had his bike stolen. Oh, you can talk to me, Mallard. Was it an inside job? I don't know. We haven't got anything to go on. But give us another two days and we'll bust this bike heist wide open. Good for you, laddie boy. Now shift your cigar and listen to me. Okay. Got something? Well, not yet. It could be... Ever hear of a lady swami known as Madame Natasha? Crystal gazing done cheap? Uh, what does she make like, Conan Doyle? Out on Buchanan near Jackson. You know her real name? Nope. Well, I can't help you then. As long as they keep the crystal gazing down to a soft stare and a low murmur, we don't bother them. Just thought I'd ask. 
know anything about an Allison Gray? Allison Gray, sure. Charming oh. character. Whole department knows about him. There's nothing we can do about it. So? Yeah, so. The biggest crook this side of Jesse James. Jesse did it with a gun. This joker does it with pen and ink. Oh, all very neat and orderly. Can't get a thing on him. A happy chappy, eh? Very happy. He's got more guys who hate his... Uh, <laughs> he's very unpopular. Yeah. Nobody likes him. Well, his wife does. She loves him. Well, that's what wives are for. That's what I keep telling you. Now, how did I walk into that one? Mallard picked up a sheaf of papers and threw it at me. It seems I had scored a point. I ducked out, got in my car, and drove up the hill to my place. I had some phoning to do, and I wanted to do it fast. Three, eight, six, two. Okay, then. The stars in their firmaments are all masterful. Good afternoon. Madame Natasha speaking. Good afternoon, Madame. I, uh... I'm calling for an appointment. Oh? You were recommended to Madame Natasha? Oh, uh, yes, yes. I'm from New York. A friend of mine was here last summer. She said you were excellent. Oh, how nice of her. And what was your friend's name? I, uh, uh, Wallace. Uh, Mrs. Jennifer Wallace. I do not seem to recall the name of Wallace. Oh, well. And you are? Uh, Betsy Ross. Ross. Very well. I can give you a sitting at nine o'clock this evening, Miss Ross. Oh, and, and I'd like to bring a friend along, if I might, a, a Mr. Turner. That's a bit out of the ordinary, Miss Ross, but uh, the stars decree. Very well. I will see you both. That was number one call out of the way. Number two call was to Rembrandt. He was going to be my Mr. Turner. He's very sharp where photography is concerned, and I wanted him along in case of tricks. He said, yes, he'd always wanted his palm bread. So I told him I'd pick him up about 8.30. Then I showered, fixed dinner, and got into an outfit that made me look as mousy as possible. With no lipstick or makeup, and with a pulled-down hat and a dumpy old gown, I achieved the desired effect. Then I got into the car and went over to Rembrandt's place. I beg your... No, no, no subscriptions, thank you. I'm not sending any more boys through... Co oh, you're, you're a woman, I think. I'm not only a woman, Rembrandt, I'm Candy. Him preserve us. Did someone throw acid on you or something? <laughs> this is my costume. Halloween isn't until next month, Candy. I know, but the spooks are here. We're going to see them this evening. Oh, perhaps so, but the way you look, it's just a matter of who scares whom. Candy, you look hideous. Well, good, that's just the way I want it. What's the idea, Dove? I don't get it. Some of these so-called fortune tellers are real smart cookies, Rembrandt. For obvious reasons, I don't want this gal we're going to visit to know who I am. Rest assured, she won't. Not the way you look. Am I that convincing, Ducky? My dear, if I didn't know better, I, I, I'd swear you just stepped off a pickle boat. Fine. That's what I wanted to hear. Come on, Rembrandt. It's time for us to peek into our futures. We got in the car and drove out to Madame Natasha's place on Buchanan Street. It was one of those old three-story gingerbread houses that still stand in San Francisco. Cornices, gables, carved pillars, ornate handrails leading up the front steps, etc., and etc. I rang the doorbell on the darkened porch and expected to be greeted by Peter Lorre. I wasn't far wrong. Oh. Good evening. Madame Natasha bids you enter the Temple of the Zodiac. Uh, yes, yes. And you are... Miss Ross, and, and this is Mr. Turner. Ah, yes. Madame is expecting you. Good. Just follow me if you will. Mm hmm uh, Here we are. This room here. You may be seated, please. Thank you. A few brief words of instruction. Madame will be here shortly. At first, do not speak to her. She has been in touch with the outer world in preparation for your visit. She is on a highly sensitive mental plane. The least little noise will cause her great harm. You will remain where you are. Madame will sit at that table over there. She will address you. Once having done so, you may talk to her. In low tones, please. Is this clear? Uh, yes. Very well. I shall leave you alone. Remember, 
Let Madame Natasha speak first. Smells like a mortuary. Part of the act, Rembrandt. The aroma of flowers all ties in with the supernatural. I can't understand why we're here, Candy. Well, I've got to start somewhere, Rembrandt. This was the only thing I had to go on. Look, dear. There's a light beginning to fade up on the door. Where does it come from? Oh, I don't know. It's a cute trick, you know that? Oh, better be quiet. I think this is the madame's entrance cue. You are gathered on the threshold of three powerful forces. The past, the present, the future. Prepare to travel with me through these three elements. The lady's name is Ross. The gentleman's Turner. That is right, is it not? You may speak. That is correct. Yes. We shall commence. Detach yourselves. Think of nothing but the past. Your childhood, your school days, vacations, your misfortunes, your happy hours, your parents. Think, think, yes. Our thought planes are beginning to meet. Music. Stars and music, they guide our lives. Yes, we are meeting. Look up there, Candy, on the wall, the face of a man. Someone is about to visit us. Do you feel the presence? Yes. Yes, I do. I seem to feel it's a relative of yours. Your father, perhaps. No. No, it's my Uncle Bart. He used to take me boating. Yes, yes, Uncle Bart. Now I know. My word, this is better than old movies. Hey, no, no, please, no, please! Fool. What? What did you say? What? Why, your friend here, he is a scoffer. I cannot go on. I am in terrible mental pain. Please, you must leave now. Immediately. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Madsen, Yukon 3, 8309. It wasn't Rembrandt who had broken the spell. It was that scream and the anguished cry from the other room that did the trick. I would have given my eye teeth to do some snooping, but the lad who showed us in did a very firm reverse and made sure we took a straight line for the front door and out. I heard the lock click behind us and that was it. We went across the street, got in the car, and took off. The fog was so thick you couldn't see 20 feet in any direction. Why are you biting your lower lip, Dove? Are you put out with me for being a scoffer? No, no, not at you, Rembrandt, but I am put out. That babe's as phony as a $3 bill. Yes, you and your Uncle Bart, who used to take you boating. Indeed. That scream and the voice, that's what did it. Very good, I thought. Sounded almost real. Oh, it was real, Ducky. Didn't you notice how excited the madame was? By Jove. I thought she came out of a trance awfully fast. And what about the vision of dear old Uncle Bart? Oh, that was rearview projection, girl. Uh, shot through some very fine cheesecloth to give it a slight distortion. Uh-huh. Well, okay, I'm making another appointment with the madame for tomorrow night. I want to see what's going on behind the scenes. Oh, where are you going now, Candy? Home and to bed. I'm tired. Then let me out on Venice Avenue, will you? I'm dickering with a man for a used car. Oh, well, I'll take you there. What's the place? Diogenes Anderson, the swapping Swede. Rembrandt got out at the used car lot, and I went home and had a good night's sleep. I wanted to have all my buttons because there were a lot of angles that needed angling. I awoke in the morning feeling quite fresh and ready for come what may. First thing to come what may was another drive out to the Valley of Wealth to check in with Mrs. Allison Gray. The door opened, but it wasn't Mrs. Gray. It was her nephew, Robert Warnicky. Oh, Miss Madsen. Come in, won't you? I'm so sorry, but it's the butler's day off. Oh, what a shame having to strain yourself on that heavy door. Thank you. Yes. 
I imagine you want to see my aunt, hmm? Yes, you imagine correctly. Is she in? Uh, no, no. She left about half an hour ago. Said something about having to see about her hair. Oh, where'd she leave it? Oh, <laughs> very clever, Miss Metz. <laughs> what about your uncle, Mr. Gray? Is he here? Oh, aren't you the one who's supposed to know where my uncle is? What do you mean by that? To repeat, you're very clever, Miss Matson. I have an apology to make to you. Oh? Yes. Yes, you're not a reporter at all. My aunt corrected my mistake. You're a private detective person. So who's denying it? <laughs> you know, you're very attractive, Miss Matson. I think I should kiss you. You what? I've never kissed a detective. Oh. <laughs> Why, you clown. Tell your aunt that'll cost her another hundred. I was so mad I boiled over and out the door. I think I drove all the way home and low at 40 miles an hour. I dashed up the stairs in my penthouse and scrubbed my face three times. And then I got to thinking how the character looked after he'd kissed me. <laughs> Lipstick all over his mouth and I started to laugh. <laughs> and I stopped laughing. It may have been the most nauseating kiss that man ever bestowed on maid, but certainly stopped me cold. I went over to the phone and called Madame Natasha's Temple of the Zodiac. Come on, answer. The stars in the firmament are all masterful. Good afternoon. Is Madame Natasha there? No. Madame is resting. Oh. Well, would it be possible to make an appointment for this evening? This evening? Have you been recommended by someone? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Miss Ruth Burdett. Burdett? Burdett? Yes. Madame Natasha doesn't seem to have a Burdett in the fire. Oh, oh, she must. Miss Burdett was there only a few weeks ago. Well, uh, very well. Madame Natasha will see you at ten o'clock. That's perfect. And your name, please? Um, Taylor. Geary Ann Taylor. <laughs> Things were beginning to roll now, and I think I saw the light. And if I was proven to be right, the light wasn't very pleasant. This time I didn't go as the mousy little character. I went as myself. I got in the car and drove out to the Temple of the Zodiac. If it had been dark the night before, it was even darker now, and I couldn't help shivering a bit. I checked my purse. There it was, my little thirty-two, and I felt bitter. Then I walked up the steps, rang, was shown in by the same gent. He didn't bat an eye, so I knew I wasn't recognized. I went through the same briefing instructions about not talking to the madame until she spoke first and so forth, and the man left. After a moment or two, so did I. Down the hall... Then I found the staircase and rambled up in the semi-darkness. There were three rooms on the second floor, none of them disclosing a thing. Besides, the agonized voice that had cried out, No, no, please don't, seemed to have come from further off. So, on up another flight to the third floor. I opened the first door. Nothing. Then Kitty Corner and another door. Still nothing. But on the third door... I could see them in the darkness. Two bodies piled side by side. I went over and lit a match. And there they were. The bodies of Mrs. Allison Gray and that of what obviously must have been her husband, Mr. Gray. Very cold and very dead. You seem to have found something, Miss Taylor. Yeah. They look quite natural, don't they? Madame Natasha is here. She is highly displeased with you. Yeah, I'll bet. Hiya, madame. Miss Taylor seems to be the curious type. You're out of character, Mr. Warnicky. You'd look better without that wig. I said you were clever, Miss Madsen. Too clever. Quick, Walter, get Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Mister, you fool, shoot again. <laughs> Candy. Oh, for Pete's sake, Rembrandt. Are you all right? I'm okay. Bullet in the arm, that's all. 
Where on earth did you come from? We were in the room across the hall downstairs when we saw you pussyfooting by, so we followed. We? Yes, we. Diogenes Anderson and I. The, the swapping Swede? What were you two doing out Candy here? Candy girl, how naive you are at times. You told me you were coming back here tonight. You didn't include me in your plan, so that meant you were coming alone. Knowing your propensity for getting into trouble, I felt it incumbent upon me to enlist the aid of my friend Diogenes and come to your assistance. Well, bully for you, Rembrandt. And I'm glad you did. What did you fellows do to these rats? <laughs> As we followed you up the stairs, we implemented ourselves with two sturdy chairs. Then it happened. They fired, you dashed past us. When those two beggars came abreast of us, we merely lowered the boom. Diogenes on one side, I on the other. <laughs> oh, my word, we really tagged them, I fear. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. They've been working overtime. They can use a little deep sleep. <laughs> Look, Candy, two bodies. Tell me about it. Well, it's very simple, Mallard, dear. This nephew of Mrs. Gray's at one time had been a ham, a, a female impersonator in vaudeville. So last year he decided to try to convince his uncle, Mr. Allison Gray, that his days were shortening, that he should atone for his wicked life. Now, how'd he go about that? By telling his uncle he should visit a fortune teller. And by a very strange coincidence, the fortune teller is a nephew, Robert Warnick. That's right, the impersonator. The same, telling his uncle, and I quote, that he should give all his money away to charities before he died. Yeah, and the uncle went for the gag? Sure. Did you ever know a man like that who didn't want to repent before passing out? Was a cinch. But all the charities were phonies, and all the checks came right back to Robert Warnicky. Well, I don't see why Warnicky had to go so far as to bump off his uncle and aunt. Did the catch wise to this racket? Well, that's it exactly, Miller. He was in so deep that he might just as well go all the way and eliminate. I see. You see, the uncle, in the first blush of being a grade A philanthropist, never questioned the charities which Warnicky suggested. Yeah, that makes sense. About a month ago, he started wondering and snooping, and he found out there were no charities. He was like a wild man. That's what made Mrs. Gray think her husband was losing his mind. Well, if I unloaded that much money through a swindle, I'd have acted crazy, too. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Well, the uncle started following Warnicky's movements. Just as he discovered that Warnicky was also Madame Natasha, Warnicky caught wise that his uncle had caught wise. He forced him into the old house on Buchanan. Mm -hmm. Now he was frightened. He didn't know how much his aunt knew. So he went back to the Gray's place, told his aunt that he had a tip as to where his uncle was. Naturally, she went along with him. She was still up in the room with her dead husband the first night Rembrandt and I went out there. It was her voice I heard crying, No, no, please don't. She'd heard our voices downstairs and tried to make a break. Warnicky's goon boy grabbed her just in time, and after we left, they did away with her, too. Hmm. A very unpretty mess. Yeah. How did you first tip to Warnicky, Candy? When he kissed me. When he kissed... When he what? <laughs> sure he kissed me. I appealed to some men. When I got home, I remembered the way he looked with my lipstick on his mouth. All I had to do was mentally put a wig on the Joker and voila, Madame Natasha. I'll be darned. Yeah. Aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? What? And turn into a fortune teller? Why, you cad. <laughs> Come here, cupcake. <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> Good night, Madame Mallard. Hmm? <laughs> well, take a look in the mirror and then get yourself a crystal ball and you're in business. <laughs> Heard tonight were Helen Cleave as Mrs. Gray, Kurt Martell as the butler, and Earl Lee as Madame Natasha's assistant. Tony Barrett played the dual role of Warnicky and Madame Natasha. Tudor Owen was Rembrandt Watson, and Whitfield Connor was heard as Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is directed by Monty Masters. The characters in tonight's story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. And don't forget... For excitement, fun, and laughs, just dial Candy Matson, Yukon 38309. Hal Gibney speaking. This has been a presentation of the NBC Program Department in Hollywood. 
These programs are brought to you by support of our listeners. You can give your support at Patreon or PayPal, either one. There's clickable links in the description below. Thanks for your support and enjoy the shows. <laughs> 